Thank you, Dr. Arun, for a kind introduction. Um, this picture of mine was taken when I was uh, uh, 10 years younger, uh, 10 years ago. I, think. I would like to thank uh, the Dr. Harry Kishan and Yeshida Hospital for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, um, uh, amazing uh, conference. So I'll try to stick to time. Uh, all right, okay. Um, so I, um, for my talk, I'm just going to focus on, um, on, on the valve. Um, um, as uh, we, all know that, uh, we all know that you know, there are many ways uh, to perform bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. So I'm just going to stick to um, the valve. <clears throat> Let, let's start with, uh, uh, with a case, a 75-year-old uh, man, ex-smoker, 50 pack years, uh, goal three, uh, very symptomatic, MMRC, uh, CT scan shows a severe emphysema, lung function test uh, showing um, uh, uh, very se uh, severe uh, uh, obstructive airway disease uh, with uh, significant air trapping, reduce uh, the LCO, uh, reduce six minute walk test distance uh, on maximal medical therapy with some comorbids. Um, so what would you do? Okay, so I, I guess the answer depends on um, where you practice, you know. If you don't have anything, anything else to offer, perhaps you do nothing. Um, I think the patient is uh, too old, uh, not, not suitable for lung transplant. So uh, it's either um, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction or LVRS. If you have a thoracic surgeon who can perform LVRS, perhaps you can discuss the case uh, uh, with your surgeon. So let's see uh, at the end what, what we did. Okay. So severe emphysema, um, um, uh, this, these are data from the US. Um, it, it costs uh, millions of uh, dollars and it's a, it's a fourth uh, leading cause of death. And uh, I, I just underlined there um, the medic that medical treatment has limited effect. And this is something that it is not uh, emphasized enough, actually. Um, even in Malaysia, you know, we, we can have one whole day uh, speaking on uh, the treatment, medical treatment for, for CV emphysema. But, uh, you know, very few people want to highlight, uh, you know, non-medical treatment for emphysema. So what's the, ra the rationale for lung volume reduction for emphysema? Basically, we want to reduce hyperinflation to, to improve the diaphragmatic function and reduce the work of breathing and to improve uh, ventilation perfusion uh, mismatch, uh, to improve uh, alveolar gas exchange and effectiveness of ventilation. So I, I'm just going to uh, highlight certain points on the slides in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the interest of time. So again, uh, um, uh, when once you achieve lung volume reduction, you improve the inspiratory capacity, and then the, your, uh, there'll be improvement in the uh, exercise endurance time. And there, there are surgical and endoscopic treatments for severe emphysema. You can do uh, lung volume reductions uh, via surgery and endoscopic. Uh, if there is a, a giant bole, uh, you, can, you could offer bolectomy, either surgical or endoscopic, you, you saw a video of our case from Malaysia where we perform endobronchial valve in a case of giant bule and a lung transplant. So let's talk about lung volume reduction surgery, LVRS. Um, the evidence uh, came from the NET trial, as we know. Um, only a subset of uh, patients actually uh, benefited uh, from uh, uh, LVRS, those uh, with uh, upper lobe predominance and low exercise capacity. Um, it has been shown uh, uh, there is improvement in dyspnea, SGRQ, exercise capacity and re the reduced uh, mortality. But the, the, the three-month mortality is, uh, is 8% and 60% mobility and uh, average hospital length of stay is almost two weeks. So 
uh, because of this, uh, mortality, morbidity associated with LVRS, um, uh, many, uh, a lot of uh, people became interested in, uh, in bronchoscopic lung volume reductions, and so this is the rationale uh, to, uh, for uh, BLVR, basically to reproduce the effects of lung volume reduction while avoiding the complication of surgery. And there are many methods. Uh, I'm just going to uh, focus on endobronchial valve. So, because endobronchial valve is the most widely studied bronchoscopic lung volume reduction technique. Um, uh, it, is, it is a unidirectional airflow valve, um, and the goal is to induce uh, atelectasis of the targeted lobe. So this endobronchial valve is not new. Uh, it has been CE mark and FDA approved um, in the US, um, I think in, in 2018. Two models, so you have um, the top one, Zephyr, endobronchial valve, and spiration valve. So endobronchial valve uh, can be deployed uh, via flexible or rigid, broncos uh, rigid bronchoscope, depends on um, how, how comfortable you are. Uh, in my practice, I always uh, use rigid bronchoscope. Uh, the reason being because this patient has very poor lung reserve and their saturation is low, so I think it is difficult uh, to, to do this procedure in patients with low saturation. It takes 45 minutes to do the procedure to maintain saturation. So I, I do it uh, under general anesthesia to ensure that uh, you, we can maintain the saturation during the procedure. And then um, easily remove uh, the valve if not working using uh, biopsy forceps. And this is what we hope to achieve um, the upper lobe collapse eh, after um, uh, endobronchial valve treatment. So the evidence for EBV uh, came um, from the Venn trial. <coughs> uh, one group received endobronchial valve, the Zephyr valve, the other group standard me medical therapy, and uh, you can see um, uh, the improvement in the um, uh, FEV1 uh, statistically significant, the primary outcome. So but then uh, there are complications uh, seen in the Venn trial, exacerbation, hemoptosis, pneumothorax, uh, pneumonia, uh, and uh, at 12 months, um, the valve had to be removed in 31 patients. So, but when we look, when we look at a subset, uh, um, a subgroup, when they did subgroup analysis of the Venn trial, they saw that, you know, <clears throat> Those patients with high heterogeneity and complete fissure had um, uh, significant improvement in FEV1 and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, in significant improvement in FEV1. So the lesson from the Venn study, basically, I think uh, uh, the main point there, uh, the potential responders, basically, uh, were those uh, with uh, complete fissure and high heterogeneity score. So, um, what about collateral ventilation? So, basically, when it is associated with uh, fissure integrity, in this case, you see that uh, in the CT scan there, the, uh, there is a complete fissure integrity, uh, um, which um, uh, suggests that, that there is no collateral ventilation. And when you have that fissure integrity, uh, it is more likely that you can achieve atelectasis of that particular lobe. Mm. So how do we measure collateral ventilation? This is how uh, we do it uh, in my place, uh, using uh, this uh, charted system, so you can see the flow. Um, when the flow declines uh, during, uh, uh, during the measurement then, then it means it is CV negative or collateral, there is no collateral ventilation. But if there is persistent flow there, then it means um, there is collateral ventilation and we won't put an endobronchial valve. So let's go through a few trials. Um, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just starting with uh, the first one, the Stelvio trial. 84 subjects uh, were included and they were excluded if collateral vent ventilation was present. Uh, 68 subjects uh, were randomized. Uh, one group received a valve. The other one received a standard care, and uh, there was improvement in the FV1 and six-minute walk distance, and but 18% uh, 
post procedure pneumothorax rate. Then, um, so as you can see, um, in the Stelvio trial compared to the VEN trial, when we uh, only choose uh, uh, those patients with, um, uh, with no collateral ventilation, um, you get more, bet uh, higher, imp better improvement in FEV1 and six minute walk, uh, six minute walk distance. Next trial is a Believer High Fire study. Uh, is a, a great trial. We, there was a sham control group, and um, uh, collateral ventilation was uh, um, was excluded excluded using uh, the Chartist uh, system. Uh, Fifty subjects, and there was improvement uh, uh, with uh, endobronchial valve at three months compared to. Uh, statistically significant improvement in FV1 uh, compared to uh, the group it, uh, that uh, compared to the sham uh, group. And what about uh, patients uh, with uh, homogeneous emphysema? Well, um, we have to thank Dr. Archang Valipo who did this study. Um, uh, again, it shows that um, um, even patients with homogeneous emphysema uh, can benefit eh, from um, uh, from endobronchial valve, but again the pneumothorax rate is quite high, 25%. Okay, then next study, transform study, um, it's a multi-center trial uh, in subject with uh, heterogeneous emphysema and absence of collateral ventilation. Again, improvement in um, FEV1 and six minute walk distance, uh, but uh, almost 30%. Uh, uh, of this patient uh, that received uh, endobronchial valve uh, develop uh, pneumothorax. So and then uh, Liberate study, uh, which was published um, in 2018, um, basically uh, it was a multi-center trial uh, using Zephyr endobronchial valve in heterogeneous emphysema with little to, or no collateral ventilation and again the improvement um, can be seen there, uh, FEV1, six-minute walk distance, uh, SGRQ, um, reduction in the degree of air trapping, and, but uh, the, um, still very significant uh, uh, rate of um, uh, pneumothorax, uh, almost 27%. And I think because of this uh, liberate study, um, uh, it has led to the approval, FDA approval in, uh, in uh, I think it was last year actually. So this is just one slide to uh, summarize eh, the, the learning journey of Zephyr Valve from uh, the NET trial uh, to, uh, to the VAN trial, Stelvio, and all the way to the Liberate study. So what about our practice uh, in my place? Uh, these are the criteria. Um, uh, for patients um, to receive endobronchial valve therapy, they must have received uh, maximal medical therapy and um, depending on the HRCT finding, um, good fissure integrity, we proceed with valve. If we are not sure, then we proceed with Chartist system and uh, if uh, uh, there is no collateral ventilation, we proceed with endobronchial valve. If uh, there is collateral ventilation, then, well, that's difficult. Options limited, uh, we may um, uh, explain to the patient um, if uh, they would like to uh, receive thermal vapor ablation, uh, which is uh, um, available also in, in my place. LVRS, well, I, will, I can still discuss with my thoracic surgeons if they are, um, uh, they are keen to do it, um, but so far I have yet to see a case uh, being done in my place. Lung transplant, I think, in, 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 in my place will take some time. Actually. So back to our patient, what we did, uh, just a quick video to show. Um, so we, we uh, being an interventional pulmonology center, we, we, um, we um, uh, explained to the patient about this procedure and we perform um, uh, endobronchial valve therapy um, in the left lower lobe, I think. Okay, I think that's the first uh, endobronchial valve. Um, that's the second one uh, in, the, in the basal segment of the left lower lobe. Okay. 
And then the third one. And then uh, the apical segment of the left lower lobe, uh, LB6, uh, we are supposed to block the entire lobe. sit. All right. And this is what we achieved uh, before. Uh, you can see the hyperinflated lung and after that uh, we, we, we managed to achieve this within a few hours uh, after, after the uh, EBV therapy that you can see the atelectasis system of the left lower lobe there. Mm. And um, as I as I said, this is not a new procedure in, in Malaysia. We have been doing it for the last uh, six or seven years, and we did present our data uh, in, in Bangkok um, last year. The complication of after EBV treatment, uh, pneumothorax, um, uh, majority of the cases eh, occurs um, within the first four days of treatment, so normally you don't discharge the patient uh, immediately after. Uh, after endobronchial valve therapy, um, we usually keep the patients uh, for for three days, you know, in the ward uh, to uh, you know to monitor for any uh, complications, mainly pneumothorax, and then the rest uh, pneumonia, COPD exacerbations, and, and then the, just the last one, there no benefit uh, or loss of initial benefit. Uh, I'm just trying. I'll try to explain that. So this is a. Actually, a similar patient uh, before endobronchial valve there, and then after endobronchial valve therapy within a few hours. But two months later, um, there's lots of uh, benefit there, as you can see there. The lungs uh, became hyperinflated again. So we had to remove the valve. What happened was the valve migrated distally. And then um, we didn't put new valve straight away. Uh, see, uh, we, are perhaps we, are plan we are planning to put new valve, uh, perhaps in uh, one or two months uh, in time, actually. So basically, complications after EBV uh, do occur, but the benefit uh, and adverse event ratio often favor, favors endobronchial valve, and uh, these are significantly less uh, compared to LVRS. You know. So, and what about pneumothorax? Pneumothorax after EBV? Uh, it is a recognized complication and it's very hard to predict, and, but the occurrence is associated with high total lung volume reduction, good outcome most of the time, and large sustained benefit in FEV1. And the onset tend to be soon after EBV placement. I think we were taught uh, uh, as a medical student that you know, pneumothorax happens, it's a bad sign, but in, in, the, in EBV uh, and endobronchial valve therapy for emphysema, it, it may be a good sign that we achieve um, collapse or atelectasis, or atelectasis of that particular lobe. A majority of patients, if not all, uh, will recover with chest drain and EBV remaining in situ. So this is just an algorithm of how we manage pneumothorax. Eh? Uh, you know, after endo endobronchial valve. So sometimes we may, ha we may have no choice. If the patient is very unstable, we may have to remove all the valve. You know. mm -hmm. uh, we may have to remove some of the valve, mainly the proximal one, and let you know, the lung re-expand, and then call the patient back again eh, for redeployment. So it's not that straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's one of the cases that we did uh, showing that um, the left, upper, the left upper zone there remain uh, collapsed, you know, okay, uh, after four or five days. You know. So, and then patient developed, as you can see, there's subcutaneous emphysema and had to be uh, intubated. We had to remove the valve. You know. So, basically, complication after EBV treatment um, needs teamwork and I suggest, we, you, know, we, we, you know, anyone who is very keen to, to do this procedure, we, we, we shouldn't be doing this if, we, we, if our center is not well equipped eh, to manage the complications. And then 
if this, this, the, your patient is extremely uh, severe, uh, very disabled, um, you probably, uh, you know, you know, explain to the patient that perhaps EBV is not, uh, you know, a, a good thing uh, uh, to do. Okay, and uh, this is what I'm, uh, I'll explain to my patient um, uh, before I um, proceed with the procedure. Usually our plan is always, hopefully everything goes uh, smoothly uh, after end of bronchovar treatment, but in reality, uh, that's what you see at the bottom there, okay? So you face all sorts of difficulties and complications um, uh, after end of bronchial valve treatment. So uh, in conclusion, uh, um, I, I think uh, in highly selected patients with severe emphysema, uh, hyperinflation uh, with minimal or no collateral ventilation, uh, endobronchial valve therapy improves uh, lung function, respiratory symptoms, uh, quality of life, exercise capacity with acceptable safety profile, but the complication rates are still uh, significant, especially pneumothorax. Thank you very much. Four minutes to spare. And this is uh, an invitation to all of you to uh, come to Malaysia in 2021 to attend the Asian, the ninth Asian Pacific Congress on Bronchology and Intervention and Pulmonology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamalul. Uh, we can take one or two questions if there are any. Okay, if there are no questions, I have a question for you. That one case that you showed that, that there was loss of initial benefit, how long would you wait to uh, place the valves again? How long? Um, I think it's, um, it's about one or two months actually because um, once you remove the valve, uh, there's a lot of inflammation and edema, you know, granular chain tissue, you know, uh, at the site where we place the valve. So, so we, we, don't want, we don't want to put the valve, new valve immediately. You know. We let the, 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 that lobe heal, uh, you know, recover uh, after one or two months, then we, you know, we call the patient back uh, for, for redeploy, you know, for reinsertion of, of the valve. Mm. Thank you. Excuse me, I, excuse me. Uh, one question I have here, somebody has. Well, what, do you, were you able to de-escalate his pharmacological treatment after the valves? Yeah, okay, uh, good question. Um, well, as you know that we are dealing with patients with uh, very severe emphysema, where m medical treatment actually has very limited effect, actually. I mean, you know, these patients are all on, on maximum medical therapy, and their lungs are still hyperinflated, you know? They have significant air trapping, uh, for which medical treatment is, is unable to, to do anything, you know. And this patient uh, will need physical treatment, basically, to reduce hyperinflation and air trapping, uh, you know, uh, which is causing uh, the dyspnea. So I'm not sure whether we can de-escalate the treatment because the treatment itself is not working already at, at this stage, you know. Thank you. It's not like... Uh, in bronchial thermoplasty, where you can de-escalate treatment, you know. Okay. But in, bron in endobronchial valve, I'm not sure, actually. Because the, the reduction in lung volume, redu in lung volume is, is because of the endobronchial valve, not, not because of the medical therapy. Thanks, sir. 